And we're still in Revelation chapter 17. I got down starting in 17 a little bit. And I'm not going to backtrack too much there because, golly, we could spend another whole class just saying the same thing again. Tanya's got, I think, just about all the lessons caught up. Uh, so they're out there on the website. If you've missed something, go out there and pick it up. But we're down to the point now, as I've been saying, we're through with the seals, and we're through with the trumpets, and we're through with the bowls, and things are finally going to start coming to a head here. So I want to pick back up at verse 6, because I had stopped at the end of that, so I'm going to read 6 and then go on a little bit. And chapter 17, verse 6, And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? Uh, I, I will show you her. I forgot now what the... I don't... I truncated that off for some reason. Yeah, I've got, I've got to go back to my Bible here. So, and I will tell you the mystery of the woman. So, in verse 6 right there, we're pointing out the fact that the woman is drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus, talking about how people on this earth have been persecuted and how this one big dominant force, if you will, I don't know any other way to, to describe it other than saying that, the Antichrist is, is trying to create one dominant Government, one dominant religion, if you will, and it's almost one and the same. If there's any worshiping that's going to go on publicly, it's going to be to the Antichrist. People who have not accepted the seal or the mark of the beast are being persecuted, and it just it's a struggle, a strife to try to just stay alive. And But you're going to see some of them have. However, some have died. And we know that by that verse right there in, in, in verse 6 where it said, the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses of Jesus are on their hands. She was drunk on this, the woman. And we talked about how the woman, as is in the scripture here, is representative of this oneness that the Antichrist has created. And John looks at that and says, gee, I'm, I'm just amazed with this. I'm just, so let me go on to verse 8 here. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come out of the abyss and go to destruction. Now remember we had some discussion about this beast arising out of the abyss in some earlier chapters. I think what the angel is telling John right here is that things are finally getting ready to come to a head. That the Antichrist and the, and the dragon knows they're going to have to have a confrontation. And God is not going to let this go. Satan is making one last pitch. And that's what he's been trying to do through this last half of the tribulation period. And remember I told you in the very beginning, Satan modeled what he was going to do after what God had done with the Holy Trinity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Satan took on this with the dragon and the beast or the Antichrist and the false prophet. And remember I described the false prophet was kind of the hitch man, if you will, or the, the guy that did a lot of the dirty work for the Antichrist, setting things up and persuading people, etc., but now things are getting ready to go to, to destruction. And it says in the rest of verse 8 there, And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Well, a couple of things I want to point out here. Notice the way the angel describes this beast, talking about already twice in the same verse, the, uh, the first part of the verse, the, the beast that you saw was and is not. 
Well, let's go back all the way to the first chapter of Revelation. <clears throat> That's a long time ago. Gosh, that's getting almost a year ago, I think. Didn't we start this about this time last year? Anyway, John had a vision. Remember? We're talking about John having a vision. And if you go back to Revelation verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 4, it talks about how it says, Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and is to come. Just the direct opposite of what was being described as coming out of the abyss. Remember John, it was described, God was described to John as from him who is, who was, and who is to come. And notice what the angel said in verse 8. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up from the abyss. So you get the description right there. Now, what I want you to understand, don't take that lightly. <clears throat> the Antichrist has deceived a lot of people. And I say, and, and back to Brian's point, and I thank him for bringing that up a couple of weeks ago. We're talking about something in the past with John, his visions of something that's not even happened yet in the future. And if I mix the tenses, pardon me, but I've you know, some of the things that we're talking about, it's almost like we're there, and, and, but, and we're looking back. And we're not there yet either, folks. This is something that it hasn't happened yet. We talked about that in the very beginning. What, the position we take on this, and you all agreed to it, the tribulation period has not happened. There are some people who believe the tribulation period is going on right now. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Part of what I, the reason I don't believe that is because if God wanted that to happen, the Antichrist would already be revealed. And he's, he, and we know it's a he, we don't know who that is. If you hear people talk about it again, it's just speculation. Just speculation. But nonetheless, the beast that you saw was, we're talking about the, the Antichrist, who he has deceived a lot of people. Remember what I told you last week, and I don't want you to lose sight of this. God is based on love. Now people tell you that. And I think people use that in some ways to develop, I'm, I'm going to say, excuses for their actions. God is love. If we didn't believe that, we wouldn't believe what's in the Bible. So I'm going to ask you right now, if you die, do you know you're going to heaven? Yes. Then you're telling me with that answer that you believe God sent his son to die on the cross for your sins and you believe the Holy Bible is his holy and errant word. Correct? Yes. Then you believe what John 3.16 says, which says very plainly, for God so loved the world and God loves you. But let me point this out too. God hates sin. And if you sin... You're going to pay a price. I don't know what that price is, people. That's God's choice. God is sovereign and makes that determination. But there's a penalty to pay for sin. I don't know what he chooses to do. That's between him and what he thinks you deserve. But people have, to have twisted this to say God is love and everything is okay and we're all going to heaven. And no, folks, unless you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and had a true salvation experience, you're doomed to heaven. That's just point blank. That's what the Scripture says. Scripture is very plain on that. You just told me a minute ago you believe what the Word says because it's God's Word. Well, what the Antichrist has done has deceived people into believing that he is, I'm going to put air quotes up here, God. He's not God. And remember, I we went through the part where it appeared to be that he was killed or somebody was killed and there was a resurrection and it was all trickery. It was all in a way to deceive the people to try to get them to believe that he was God Almighty. And folks, he's not God Almighty. 
the beast that you saw was and is not. And that way I take that is not is to plainly tell you he is not God or God affiliated. Now I said a minute ago about how much God loves you. And he does. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. A lot of times we may look and say, I don't understand why something happened. Why did God let this go on or why did he let this take place? God's got your best interest at heart, folks, for whatever it is. We may not understand it now, but one day when you get to heaven, and those of you who answered yes, and I said, I think everybody did, but I can't see everybody. When you get to heaven, you're going to have that understanding and divine knowledge. You will understand why some things happen. And, you know, just a little side note, preachers said before, you know, people think when they get to the to heaven, they're going to say, well, me and God going to have a little talk. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think when you get to heaven, you're going to be so overwhelmed and thrilled to be there, and joy is going to flow out of you like a river, and you're going to get on your knees, and you're going to be thanking and praising him. And all of these, well, I'm going to find out. You're not going to have those thoughts. You're not going to come close to it. No. I almost said, I can't wait to get there. <laughs> we're another week closer than we were last Sunday. Somebody was talking about how close it is. About thinking, well, the signs are, are yeah, the signs, the signs have been there for a long time if you look at them. Signs have been there. What's God's intention? I don't know. He thinks on a much higher plane. His plan is more than I can ever understand. But I'll tell you one thing. We're a week closer than we were last Sunday. That's all I can say for sure. But as much as God loves you, Satan hates you. Satan has no love. You're going to see here in a few verses how that comes to be, too. When people who have taken the mark of the beast, who have put their trust into this false god, and the price that they're going to pay for that. Because they are. They're going to pay a price too. Not only from, from God, but also from, from Satan through the Antichrist. But here's something I want to point out. Let me go to that part of the verse here where it says, And those who dwell on the earth, whose name has not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. There's an interesting scripture. You may be aware of it. I wasn't as aware of it. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3. And what this verse says, actually it's three verses, verses 3 and 4. Now, remember in 2 Corinthians, this is Paul writing to the church at Corinth. You have to know a little bit about what was going on. At Corinth was a very corrupt place. Corinth had a whole lot of bad things happening there. The seaport town. And, oh my, a lot of bad stuff going on in God's eyes. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, And even if our gospel is veiled. Now, you know what I mean when I say veiled? Meaning, you can't see it. We talk about women wearing veils in front of their face. Why do women wear veils? So you can't see their face. Well, that's what it's talking about here. If people can, cannot see, and I don't mean just literally visually, I'm talking about understand it and accept it and know what it means and apply it. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In whose case the God, small g, not capital G, small g, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they may not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is in the image of God. So you're sitting there saying, what did he just say? What he said was this. 
<coughs> through Paul, he's telling the people there in Corinth, you can get to a point where the idol that you are worshiping can blind you to where you would not be able to see the truth of God. That's what it boils down to. Now, I bring that up for this reason. <coughs> Remember how the last few meetings we've had, I've been trying to draw a parallel. Almost as if what we're doing now, in many respects, is a dress rehearsal of the tribulation period. I don't believe the tribulation period is happening now. I don't believe so. But, for example, let me, let me, where I'm getting to with this. We talked a little bit about persecution. I brought up, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Turn the clock back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Christians weren't persecuted. No, weren't persecuted. Sure, you had missionaries who were going into dangerous areas, but those areas were dangerous regardless if they were a missionary or, or just a foreigner to the, to the native people who lived there. Today, Christians are persecuted more than ever before. Now, I'm not talking about putting you on a cross and throwing stones at you the way they did to Stephen or something like that. But I'm talking about your, I don't know if you want to say you're right because of the country that we live in, to be able to express or practice the religion that you so choose. And if you are a Christian these days, you are looked down upon for practicing Christianity. You are, in many ways, persecuted for being a Christian. I brought up an example of, and you probably, I won't go into a lot of details, I think it was in Oregon, of the bakery that refused to bake a wedding cake for this homosexual couple. <coughs> I think it was two lesbians had gone in. Uh, they said, no, that really violates our religious beliefs. We're, we're, we really don't want your business. They're basically now out of business. They were forced out of business. They were fined under state law a huge amount of money. Now, I bring that up to say this. I don't think you would have seen that 50 years ago. I don't think you may have seen it 40 years ago. But now, persecution is happening more and more. And those of you who, you know, we were kidding a little bit about the sports thing. Prayer before a football game at a high school football game. Documented occasions where coaches have lost their jobs because they've had prayer with the team before the game or after the game and the administration or school board said stop that. Either quit or lose your job. Now folks, that didn't happen years ago. Didn't happen years ago. And I'm not talking about extreme cases where you've got a lot of, I'll call it liberalism in the West, like in California or up north. I'm talking here so-called in the Bible Belt, which is where supposedly we live. What God's people are going through right now, I believe, is going to be, uh, it's, it's not going to be near to the degree of persecution that has happened during the tribulation period, but I believe you're seeing a little bit of a dress rehearsal right now of some of the things that's going on or that will happen. Because when we read what goes on during this tribulation period, we sit here and just shake our head and say, I don't see how anybody can survive that. I don't see how anybody who's a Christian can literally live through this tribulation period. I don't know either, folks. I really don't. I don't know how they're going to do it. But some, I believe, will have the fortitude and perseverance to do that.
because it says in the scripture there's going to be some who more than we can count if you go back to chapter 7 more than we can count and oh my right there though this was backed up in Corinthians chapter uh, 4 verses 3 and 4 and what I wanted to bring home with that scripture is don't you see that very thing today people get blinded by the idol that they're worshiping and bowing down to now and therefore they don't see the true word of God now I'm not saying when I mean idol a, a, a bust of something on a pedestal somewhere I'm talking about whatever it is you have put on your list that is higher than God it could be family it could be sports involvement it could be your career it could be a lot of things I'm not going to I'm not going to name names. Wouldn't dare do that. But I bet you, if I went around the room right now, every one of you could tell me somebody that you're aware of who per, who professes to be a Christian, but they have put their focus somewhere else, and they're staying away from the house of God and serving God. I can tell you, people in this church right now who used to come to this church, they don't come here now because. Some other idol has moved up to the number one spot. Now, folks, I'm not. I'm getting a lot of kind of deer in the headlight looks. I'm telling you the truth. Amen. That's true. I'm telling you the truth. And if you want to stick your head in the sand and pretend it doesn't happen, folks, it's happening right here. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't have a magic answer or the pixie dust to throw on it and solve the problem. I'm just telling you, that's exactly what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth right there, where you can get so blinded that you don't see the real truth in the Word of God and you do what you need to do. It also, to me, what he says later about Paul, I mean, Paul saying later about staying the course. And finishing the race. Boy, that tied right into this as far as I was, I could see. Oh my, how easy it would be to get off track. And folks, don't, don't fall for a minute. I'm off a little bit from Revelation, but I just felt this had to be said. How easy it is for the devil to throw something your way. God's not going to tempt you. Let's get that straight. God doesn't tempt. Devil tempts. The devil's going to throw something out there to try to get you to say, wow, that's a pretty shiny penny. I think I'd like to follow that pretty shiny penny. Hey, you may not buy for it. Somebody might. But I'll guarantee you, the devil's going to come back and throw something else your way. That's why it's important to stay grounded in the Word of God. There may be times you slip up, you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off. You ask God for forgiveness. Ask God for strength. to dump, you know, Don't burn me twice. Don't let me fall for this again. We're not perfect. We're not going to be perfect. But you have a God who will forgive you and a God who will give you strength. And folks, this part right here, I, it's... How many people can you imagine today are being veiled of the word and the truth of God because they've got their focus somewhere else. It's scary to death. Those who've been here a little while, how many years ago was it we were running two services? Back in the 90s, early 90s. Early mid 90s. Right? Years ago. <laughs> running two services. Sunday school numbers. Oh, though. They're popping 500, 600, somewhere around that, I think. You're lucky to push 250 in Sunday school now. How I many we counted? Jack and I always have this thing, they've got a counter thing. And then when they get through counting, he said, What's your estimate today? How many is that? 
I, I'd come close. Usually go about ten, fifteen dollars. <laughs> I was, was all big time. What we had like two eighty last week or something. Three thirty after we count the choir and three thirty. And the thing, folks, we used to run two services. It's the same way with the youth. Back when my kids were in the youth department, which was back in the seventies, we had a our youth choir was as big as the adult choir, yeah. and we had, you know, and. Kids just, they're not interested anymore. But a lot of that's because parents are not interested. Well, I, I didn't want to get too far off that, but I had to bring that out because as verse 8 talks about the ones who are not in the book of life, it almost gets to, almost like they're describing people with the reprobate minds. Briefly, we talked about that, not in this, but... I think our study of, I don't know if it's John or Romans, a reprobate mind, meaning you just you get to the point you don't care. You just push God aside. I don't want anything to do with God. Don't want anything to do with Christianity. I don't need God. There is no God. You know, you fill in the blank. And oh my, what a dangerous position to get in. When you get to the point of a reprobate mind, God may take you out in a heartbeat. That's almost like the, this is the first step or two to getting to that point. And it could be even describing some of these people. Because they said there in Second Corinthians, it's veiled. People don't see it. And you're not going to be able to see it because the God that you're worshiping, the false idol, is blinding you from the truth. Oh, what a sad state to be in. But the paradox of today in this country... If you want to turn on the media, TV per se, there's more preaching that you can see on TV than it has ever been before. I mean, you have to look for it a little bit, but you think about the paradox is that the information, the, the word, the way the word gets around the world, it's, it's so paradoxical, but people are falling off faster and faster. To a degree, I agree with you. The technology has allowed more access to more things than we've ever had before. True, more of these evangelistic shows or evangelistic programs, but as a side note to that, I want to, I want to point out, don't believe everything you hear out of some of those people. Simply because they, they claim to be a preacher doesn't make them a preacher of God. But think about what Lexi does. Oh, exactly. Who would ever thought about it 25 years ago that he was able to communicate to China, sure. to Russia, wherever that... Exactly. I mean, it's yeah. just amazing, but I say it's paradoxical yeah. because we focus so much on this country, what's going on, and we forget about the rest of the Western world, what's going on, and we kind of isolate ourselves away. But all the trauma that's going on in countries like Europe and France, mm -hmm. and, I mean, they're, whether we like it or not, we're Christian-based countries at some point in time. Mm -hmm. And they're vastly losing that oh, yeah. recognition or that base. Well, to, to that point, kind of, as far as like technology, and it goes back, remember when we talked about in the very beginning, there's going to be a trumpet, and there's going to be a shout. How's the whole world going to hear all that at the same time? There, there'll be a way. God's got a way, and he'll make it happen, or it wouldn't be in his word. That's the way I believe it. So, Do I know how? I don't have a clue how he's going to do it. He's God. He can do it any way he wants to. Um, what you were talking about, about the uh, veil, or, you know, where people's eyes are blinded, it goes really all the way back to Genesis when it talks about how the snake was the most subtle of all creatures and that's you know over the years Satan has become even more subtle he, mm -hmm. he knows everything he can use to turn people away from God and I think one of the biggest things that's happened in America is no fear of God mm -hmm. and no fear of Satan you have people that really believe that Satan's not real that he's just something made up to try to get people to do what you want them to do. And until people come to grips with the fact that he is real, and when they die, they're going to go to hell if they don't accept Christ, they're never going to change. And it's much easier to sit back, just like the love of God versus the wrath of God. 
it's much easier to believe, well, God loves everybody. Mm -hmm. and he's not mm -hmm. going to let anybody go to hell. We're all, in the end, we're all going to go to heaven until people realize the difference between love and justice and hate and love and they're, they're never going to change. And, and there's a lot of, of so-called preachers, like you said, out there nowadays. They're not preaching about hell. They're mm -hmm. not preaching mm -hmm. about sin. Mm -hmm. And they're leading, it's like a wolf in sheep's clothing, as they say. They're leading people down the primrose path, and they're falling for it. Let me go and to, to your point about back in Genesis with the serpent and Eve. Satan does not have your best interest at heart. No. Regardless of how he may portray it. And that's what the Antichrist is doing to a lot of these people here. Because remember, this is after the rapture and so many things. And here you've got this uh, uh, figurehead that emerges and he's convincing people, I got, I got you. And as a common phrase today, I got your back. Mm -hmm. I got your back. I mean, go ahead and do whatever. If something comes up, I'll make sure that you're not hurt out of this. Wrong. He does not have your best interest at heart. He would like to see you perish in hell. Period. And you're going to see that in just, uh, I guess I don't know if we'll get to it there. I guess not. <laughs> Let me go to verse 9. And I'm, I, I'm, I'll get just a little bit into this, but I know we'll have to pick this back up. Here is the mind, verse 9, here is the mind which has the wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And they are seven kings, five have fallen, one is, the other has yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. Now I gotta stop right there because if I go on anymore, it's really gonna get deep. I'm talking about ten horns. It's, right it's deep right here. <coughs> You're gonna find if you if you choose to dig a little deeper on some of this, talking about the seven heads on seven mountains, you're gonna find some of the commentaries who are going to point seven mountains as meaning the seven hills of Rome. You're going to hear people tie Rome as to being the great city. And you're going to hear people try to tie Catholicism as the oneness religion. I don't know that I buy all of that, folks. I just want to point it out to you. Be careful. When you read different commentaries explaining their thoughts about what is meant with the seven heads and the seven mountains, people start trying to, they get a little bit, little bit in left field. Here's what I take on this. The seven heads, we talked about seven nations, if you will, back in chapter 12. I gave you a list of seven nations back then. Seven mountains, to me, means each one of these sits on one of these mountains. Who's at the top of the mountain? The leader. So it's symbolic of leadership positions. It doesn't mean you have seven leaders in five nations. You have seven leaders in seven nations or seven governments or whatever uh, word you choose to use there. Then it says, on which the woman sits. What that means to me is that these have joined forces into one. Through the Antichrist, he's been able to configure, again, this oneness. And because of this oneness, you've got everybody reaching up, or if you want to say worshiping, uh, respecting, I don't know what's the right word to put in there, looking up to the Antichrist as the leader. Notice here, though, it says, five, out of the seven kings, five have fallen. Well, if you study a little bit deeper on that, the five that fell are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, and Greece. 
Now, you say, how do you know that? Well, in Ezekiel chapters 29 to 30, it talks about the demise of Egypt. Nahum describes the demise of Assyria. Jeremiah describes, and also in Revelation, we've got to talk about the destruction of Babylon. Daniel, in two or three places, talks about Persia. And in chapter 11, he talks about the demise of Greece. So you can start to see, again, let's confound it even further. Is this future or is this past or when did all this happen? Now I do have the deer in the headlight look. The empires, uh-huh. the, the empires as they were then are already destroyed, but this is symbolic of something else that's going on. It's bringing the history to the future of what was and what did happen, and here's what's going to emerge out of this, because the Antichrist is going to bring all this together. One comment, and we need to remember this. This book was not written in the century we're living in, or even 200 years ago. It was written back oh, yeah. 2,000 years ago in the known world that we live in, as far as people then didn't know it existed. Yeah. So everything was focused basically on what we call the Middle East, Europe, yes. a little bit of Africa. And that's part of the reason that you read I think some of the things that are said in relation to the countries that were known. And that's where the history was recorded and known about. Well, that's the, that's the oldest part of the world in that. Because look at look at this country. You know, we talk we think we're here for a long folks this country hadn't been here. This is still a baby. You know, I've never had I, I, I've known some people who've gone into the English area, and Ireland, whatever, and they talk about castles that have been there a thousand years or what? How old is this country? Do the math. We're talking about places that have been in existence since Jesus, which was a long time ago. I'm going to stop there or the preacher will be mad at me because I can keep you another hour for sure. <laughs> But I'm going, to pick, I'm going to pick back up. I don't want to leave these seven kings and the seven mountains just yet. Okay, next Sunday, no class. So, I got 13th, right? November. Yeah, no class on the 6th. We'll meet again on the 13th. So.